Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Guillermo Emerald joins me. We're going to be talking about PG Backrest, the way to back up your Postgres data and restore it efficiently. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E. F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Guillermo Amaral. Episode 429, recorded April 11th, 2017. PG Backrest. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by GoCD, an on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery server by ThoughtWorks. GoCD gives you complete control of and visibility into your deployments across multiple teams. Since GoCD is open-source, you can download and use it for free. To discover the power of their pipelines, visit gocd.io slash twit. And by Cloudflare, the operating system for the edge of the Internet. More than 6 million websites, apps, APIs, and SAAS companies use Cloudflare services to load fast, stay secure, and weather whatever the Internet throws at them. For a free online chat session with a Cloudflare support engineer, visit cloudflare.com slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week... The movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download right after this show and play with. And I bet there's a certain category of people out there that will probably want to do that with today's topic. Uh, joining me th- today is my co-host is Guillermo Amaro. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Randall. How's it going? Hey, hi, hi. And uh, where are you speaking to us from? Uh, my, my Tijuana bunker. Same place. You can probably tell. Oh. <laughs> Okay, a little cleaner today though. I don't see quite as many things on the on the back wall. Maybe I'm just confused. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, but actually, it's a lot. It's a little dirtier than usual, but it's everything's on this side where you can't see it. <laughs> Okay, well, that's, uh, you know, moving things around. I mean, there's a lot of clutter in this uh, uh, office that I'm sitting in as well. I'm at, uh, once again, at the uh, ZipRecruiter headquarters in uh, downtown Santa Monica. I'm on the 11th floor, and uh, we have figured out finally that if you lower the shades all the way, you can actually see behind me, if you're watching the video, you can actually see the skyline behind me. Uh, Same thing we used to do from the 43rd floor of the uh, third tallest building in uh, downtown LA, but that was a long time ago. Anyway, so this isn't this week in geography. This is this week. No, it's not a this week show. It's this, it's Floss Weekly. So let's talk about open source software today. And uh, today we have a really uh, personally interesting project, although I end up always wanting to play with all the stuff that I ever talk about on this thing. But um, it's because it involves one of my favorite things to talk about, and that's Postgres. I'm not a very big MySQL fan. I'm a Postgres fan as soon as I figured out how to start using it and installing it. And I still prefer that for a new starts, but unfortunately, a lot of my clients end up uh, uh, starting with MySQL because they don't know of anything else. But what we're going to talk about today is backup and restore. Now, that sounds boring, but it's absolutely essential in the world of databases, in the world of uh, trying to, uh, you know, be up and running, be live. Uh, You want to have all your data backed up. You want to test your backups. You want to also be able to recover quickly. And David Steele, who came up with PG Backrest, uh, started developing it a while back, um, has come up with some uh, really cool uh, ideas and concepts around how to get backups being done with Postgres. There's a number of uh, solutions for doing uh, backups in Postgres, but he seems to have gotten something uh, fairly innovative here. So we'll be bringing him on in a couple of minutes. Uh, Guillermo, you have anything to add to this before we bring him on? Well, sounds about right. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big database guy anymore, at least. Uh, but I, I okay. have uh, had to uh, make a copy of a database, uh, you know, once in a while. So I, I'm, I, I, I am um, familiar with the uh, issues with, you know, tarring and copying things over and rsync and what else. Uh, and I yes. know importing can also be an issue. So I'm, I'm guessing this will solve all of those problems, which is good. I'm hoping it will. But uh, before we bring him on, I do have an important message to bring to you because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by GoCD. GoCD is the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery server created by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD's comprehensive pipeline modeling, you can model complex workflows across multiple teams with ease. GoCD can easily configure dependencies for fast feedback and on-demand empl- deployment with its parallel and sequential execution. It's fan-in, fan-out dependency management always does the right thing, avoiding spurious builds. The 
value stream app lets you track a change from commit to deploy at a glance. GoCD's real power is the visibility it provides over your end-to-end -end workflow, so you get complete control of and visibility into all your deployments across the organization. GoCD offers complete customization for your software's individual needs. GoCD will perform tests written in most languages or frameworks. Their test reporting will tell you in exactly which change set and on which platform a test started breaking. You can compare content across any two arbitrary builds, making it invaluable when troubleshooting a broken pipeline. GoCD supports auditable deployment and can delegate the configuration of pipelines to users without full-blown admin privileges. GoCD has extension points for which plugins can be created, and numerous plugins are available to you or you can write your own. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. GoCD is open source that you can download and use for free. Discover the power of their pipelines at gocd.io slash twit. That's gocd.io slash twit. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are also available. And we thank GoCD for their support of Floss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring in our guest, David Steele. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, where are you speaking... Yeah, thank you. Uh, and you're welcome. And where where are you speaking to us from? I'm uh, in my office at Crunchy Data Solutions in Chantilly, Virginia. Ah, ah three hours ahead of us. Okay, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> All the rest of us are West so, Coast today. So yeah, yeah. So you got any stock time. picks for for this? Yeah, stock picks. No, no, just kidding. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Hey, so uh, so give us a thirty thousand foot view. What is PG Backrest? What problem is it trying to solve? Okay, so. Obviously, it's backup software for Postgres. Uh, it's not the first one. A lot of them have been written. Uh, we we saw certain problems, and we wanted to take a completely different approach. And so that's how PG Backrest was born. It was really designed in concert with Stephen Frost, who's a committer on the Postgres project. So he's got a lot of intimate knowledge about Postgres. Uh, I've also been a user for 18 years. Uh, so together, we kind of pulled our knowledge and decided... All other things being equal, let's say we didn't worry about uh, how much time we were going to spend developing or how hard it would be. What would a solution look like? Um, and the big thing that we decided was using the standard command line tools that are typically used in backup, like rsync, tar, uh, you know, et cetera, was a problem. Uh, it put a lot of constraints on the software. Uh, in terms of parallelism, in terms of, you know, extra types of checks you could do against the data. And so our decision was to eliminate all of that, uh, come up with a, uh, you know, basically implement all that uh, in our software instead. And that would allow us, as painful as it would be to do all of that, that would allow us to then uh, implement all of these kind of cool features that, you know, people see in PG Backrest that would be very difficult to do using command line tools. Well, I mean, you could argue that you know I've got a I've got a slave set up. I've got a read-only slave set up of, my, of Postgres, and there used to be some bolt-on solutions to do that. Now it's sort of uh, baked into the actual releases. Uh, isn't that a backup? Is, and isn't isn't that sufficient for what we're trying to talk about today? Uh, a replica actually is not a backup. Uh, that's kind of like saying RAID is a backup. <laughs> um, the biggest problem with a replica generally is that uh, unless you have a replication delay built in everything you do on the master is instantly reflected on the replica. So let's say you drop a table off the master, well, that is go that table is going to be dropped in your replica almost instantly. So, uh, and of course, there are situations where an entire data center might go out, you might lose your master and your replica. So a replica should be considered part of an HA solution. Uh, there are a lot of components to HA. One of those is backup, uh, replication, other things like that. But a replica in itself is not a backup. Okay, well, that um, and so what? What extra features do you need to really have a backup then? Well, the main thing is you you need to be able to uh, move back in time. Uh, the whole, you know, there are certain things. Uh, so a backup might just be to recover from a hardware failure, uh, but in that case, actually, replicas are your first line of defense. So if your master fails, you can fail over to your replica, and and you're good to go. So where backups come in really handy is uh, moving back in time. So you discovered that something bad happened to your data, uh, some big mistake was made, and so with a backup and with wall uh, write-ahead logs from the database, you're actually able to restore a backup and then move forward to any point in time that you want to, uh, to recover that lost table, to recover that lost customer record. Uh, the other thing you can use backups for is to 
uh, say, bring up reporting servers or uh, do development work or, uh, you know, staging. And you don't really want to plug those things into your production environment, say, using base backup or, or something that would require direct access to prod. Uh, so you can do those sorts of things from your backups. Uh, you can also bring up new replicas from your backups. Uh, so there are a number of purposes, you know, even outside of disaster recovery that you can use backups for. I was uh, pleased when I was looking over the documentation that uh, at least at one point this was all in Perl. Uh, why was that your choice of language? Uh, boy, <laughs> good question. Um, the reason it was originally in Perl is because I had written a number of backup solutions over the years in Perl. Uh, so that was a good starting point because I had done that before. Uh, Perl is a pretty good language to you know work at the system level with. It allows you to uh, rapidly prototype, you know, basically get something to market pretty quickly. It's it's generally portable. It's generally available. Uh, the libraries that I needed to make PG Backrest work are available in package form on a majority of operating mm -hmm. systems. So it just seemed like a good choice from that perspective. Uh, we have started moving some functionality into C, uh, particularly the newer page checksum feature. Uh, but for the most part, the, the bulk of the project is in Perl and will probably remain that way for some time to come. So talk to me about how this is typically used then. Okay, so I'm, I've, got a, I've got a Postgres solution. I do have a couple replicas. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to start doing uh, point-in-time backups, I guess, so I can do this thing about rolling forward if something bad happens. Can you, can you tell me what, the, what are some of the issues of getting something like this set up and, and uh, getting it to work? Well, it's actually remarkably simple. Uh, one of the project goals of PG Backrest was to work uh, with with very very large databases and you know work in parallel and work at a large scale and deal with very very complex situations. But at the same time, be simple to set up for users who uh, had you know maybe just one database or have a you know a, a small collection of clusters or things like that. So you can go if you just have one database you can start really simple and just do backups uh, locally. Uh, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but if you're doing backups of the server itself then you know that's one technique you can use. Uh, you can back up to NFS. Um, a better method is actually to uh, have a backup server and a larger enterprise you'd want to do this where that server is responsible for scheduling and running all the backups. And in that case, that server will uh, do the backups. The master database is just required to, you know, do its uh, be configured to do archiving uh, to get those write ahead logs off of the server. And then the uh, the backup server is also where the replica and the replica is, or standby, however you want to call it. So the the standby can, let's say, it loses touch with the master, can use the uh, re uh, the backup server to get write ahead logs. Uh, to catch up, you can build new standbys from there. And the other thing is the backup server can do backups from the standby rather than from your master. So because Backrest uses SSH as its uh, protocol, you know, transport for its protocol, uh, setting up that trusted connection is very easily. It's just, or sorry, very easy. Uh, you do it just like you'd set up any SSH connection. A trusted SSH connection, and then back all the, the, the you know backrest on the different servers will start talking to each other. So setup's really easy, uh, and then once you've got everything going, most of the uh, parts that most of the common scenarios that you're going to need to deal with have been thought of by backrest and are available as options. Uh, various recovery scenarios, point in time recovery, uh, you know, uh, full backups, delta backups, things like that. Uh, they're all available at the command line and, and very simple to run. And you don't have to, for instance, write your own restore, uh, or sorry, recovery.com files and, and et cetera, which when you're trying to get a system up and running again after a failure is really not what you want to be worrying about. Uh, you did mention uh, that you have uh, something like SSH in order to, you know, like a tunnel between the systems. Uh, are, is it like SSH? Are you rolling your own or or is it actually SSH? Uh, it is actually SSH. Sorry, maybe I was channeling my inner valley girl there or something, but <laughs> it is actually just standard SSH protocol and everything's run over that. Uh, one of okay, the advantages of this I, I, is... I'll go ahead, yeah. sorry. Oh, oh I was go, saying go one, ahead, of the advantages, sorry. one of the advantages is that you don't actually have to expose the Postgres port to, for instance, the backup server. 
uh, with most backup solutions, you need to have, uh, you know, that port has to be available to start and stop the backup. But because Backrest has its own protocol, it actually uh, sends those commands through the protocol layer rather than having to send them, you know, host to host over TCP. So I, I know this uh, this already has Postgres in the name, right? So it's PG Backrest. Mm -hmm. uh, but are you maybe planning on porting this to some other engine later, like MySQL or any anything else? I guess. I I have actually thought about that, and it's one of the reasons why uh, you know in the software I resisted uh, for the command names and stuff using uh, terms like wall push and wall get. Uh, you know, I used archive push and archive get instead, and and all the general options and stuff also follow that same pattern. And the idea was yes to possibly expand this to other database platforms. To be perfectly frank, uh, it's been such a large project, and I've spent so much time on it just to get it up to snuff for uh, Postgres that I don't see myself doing that in the near future. But perhaps that's something that someone else would contribute, or 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 use the you know framework of PG backrest to develop a MySQL solution. Yeah, I was, I was mentioning that it's good that you uh, can keep a layer of uh, abstraction there just in case you want to later on replace that or if something really big changes in Postgres, you can adjust to different versions, I suppose. Um, so I did have another question. Uh, in this case, uh, you do you did mention that you've been working on this for a while. Is, is somebody paying you to do this work or is it just your hobby or, uh, you know, you, is your company paying you to do this work for a Postgres back, for a PG backrest? Well, it, it actually started, uh, actually, um, a company I worked for before my current company, Resonate Networks, uh, which is an ad tech company. And they had, as you can imagine, really, really big databases. And we were trying to solve the problem of, of backing those databases up. We'd used some of the standard solutions and really nothing was working. So at that point, Stephen and I sat down and we mapped this thing out. Uh, we talked to our employer there and said, you know, we want to do this as an open source solution. And they were on board with it. They had no problem with that. I mean, obviously, there are advantages to them. They still use the software now. You know, I've been gone from there for three years, but they still run PG Backrest. So then when I came to Crunchy, uh, so Crunchy Data, Data Solutions, my employer, we uh, essentially do Postgres support. We do development. Um, we've got a lot of committers here. We do a lot of backend development. Uh, I've also worked on a project called PG Audit uh, as well. So, um, yeah, actually, at this point, Crunchy Data Solutions is funding uh, most of the PG Backrest work. But it's also my personal project, so I spend a lot of my own time on it, too. Uh, so at this point, you could say it's probably about 50-50. But I, I, I will say that it would not be in the state it is now without the support from Crunchy Data. So how would this actually compare to something, let's say, like R-Sync and tarring, you know, everything else and just copying it, you know, keeping a copy or maybe a snapshot using something like the uh, a snapshot a snapshot features on FreeBSD? Uh, it, it, would this be comparable to something like that or is this going to be faster, more efficient? I'm guessing if mm -hmm. it'll automatically do it for you, you don't have to worry about it, it's just going to be better. But uh, have you guys actually compared both solutions? Well, certainly, um, I actually have uh, in the standard talk that I give on PG Backrest at conferences, I have a slide that actually talks about a uh, performance comparison between rsync and PG Backrest. rsync is actually natively a little bit faster than PG Backrest. Uh, it's written in C and it has you know some advantages. But the problem with rsync is it doesn't do destination compression. So when the data gets to the destination, it's not compressed. And if you have very, very large databases, this is a serious problem, uh, especially since Postgres data actually compresses really well. There's a lot of repetition in it, in the tuple headers and page headers and et cetera. So you can often get 75 to 80% compression. So to have to store that uncompressed is really painful. So if you compare PG Backrest to rsync in terms of you know, if you are synced it and then you had to compress it, PG Backrest is already quite a bit faster. Then, if you introduce multiprocessing, and we have people using PG Backrest who are running up to 64 parallel processes to do compression for backup and restore. So, in those cases, you know, the performance compared to our sync is, you know, there's just simply no comparison. Now, snapshots are a different deal. Uh, snapshots obviously can be quite fast. Um, there's the first problem with snapshots is that the snapshot is taken on the database server to start with. 
And so you've got to get that snapshot, you know, export that snapshot before it actually consists of a backup. You know, data sitting around the database server is not really a backup. So uh, you've got that problem of exporting those snapshots. You've got the problem of thinking about, you know, scheduling of expiration now. How long do you keep the snapshots? And then you're still left in the same position of dealing with the write-ahead log. You know, you've got to make sure that that write-ahead log gets exported or, you know, moved off of the server or you're in a situation where you just have these point in time backups and, you know, let's say you're taking them once a day and you your database server dies at 11 p.m., you might lose 23 hours of data unless you've actually kept the write ahead logs to, you know, make that backup play forward. Uh, and what we found actually dealing with the write ahead logs, doing archiving correctly, uh, dealing with, you know, network errors and duplication and the database pushing the same archive log again. Uh, you know, timelines, expiration, uh, associating archive logs with different versions of Postgres as you upgrade, et cetera, et cetera. I can't even go into all of it. But it turns out that's actually a much harder problem in detail than backup itself is. Backup is all about parallelism and copying files and compressing them as quickly as possible. Archive logging has a lot of rules around it. And if you get those wrong, then you may find that you don't have the backup that you hoped you had. Hey, uh, so we have a question from the chat room. Esol asks, uh, how would one okay. see into PG Backrest and see, get the status of backups? Okay, so there's an info command uh, that you can run at the command line. You can run that anywhere in the, in the uh, ecosystem. So let's say you've got a, a master, a replica, and a backup server. So you've got three servers. Most of the mm -hmm. PG Backrest commands are symmetric. So you can just run them wherever you want. Uh, the info mm. command falls into that category. So you, you can run info. There's two ways to get info. The default is text output, uh, which you know we add stuff to and kind of mess with the formatting uh, on from time to time. So in the documentation, it, it warns you to never try to parse the text output because we make no guarantees mm. that the format will stay the same from release to release. For that, we have JSON output. So if you do dash dash output equals JSON, It'll give you, the, you know, everything it knows about the the database backups, write ahead log, what write ahead log is associated with with backups, you know, when the backups were done, uh, you know, basically all the information that PG Backrest knows about the uh, backup repository is dumped out in JSON format. And the JSON we actually do maintain compatibility over releases, so we add new fields fairly regularly as we have new information to add or we think of things that might be useful to people. But we don't take anything away or, or change any of the names there. So that's your stable format for getting information out of PG Backrest for just, you know, obviously looking at it manually. Um, if you want to integrate into your monitoring system, then that's the way you're going to do it using the info command and, and the JSON output. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, I'm sure Esol appreciates that as well. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I haven't asked this question yet. What, what versions of Postgres does this work with? So... It actually works with uh, post versions 8.3 through 9.6, uh, which sounds like a lot, and it is. But up until <laughs> yeah, <laughs> up until maybe a year ago, uh, there were still a lot of people running 8.4 in the field, and a lot of people were doing it not because they wanted to, but because they had some dependency, you know, some software dependency uh, that was required 8.4, and they hadn't upgraded yet. So in the last year or so, it seems incidents of people who are running 8.4 has all but disappeared. Obviously, 8.4 has been EOL for uh, at least two years now. So you know, people have finally caught up and said, well, we can't use 8.4 anymore. But it doesn't really cost a lot to maintain that support. And so for now, we're hanging on to it. And is it possible to back up from one version of of uh, one one release level of Postgres and restore it on another version, or is that the same problem you have with the binary wall logs and things like that? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not. You would have to do a PG upgrade. What PG Backrest does support is it does support uh, backup over versions. So let's say you do your PG upgrade, you can notify Backrest that you've done an upgrade, and it will record that into the repository. And it'll, but it'll still do expiration over your backups on multiple versions of Postgres, you know, based on your backup schedule. So Backrest is certainly aware of the fact that you might be upgrading and, and using multiple versions of Postgres. You can certainly be using multiple versions of Postgres with Backrest in a single repo. 
So you might have one 9.5 database and one 9.2 database, and that works perfectly fine. Uh, Backrest does not, unfortunately, automatically do that binary upgrade for you. That's quite a complicated procedure, and pulling that out of PG upgrade, you know, trying to duplicate that PG upgrade code would, would probably be unwise. Yeah, the unfortunate thing about PG upgrade is it requires two installations running side by side. Um, I I'll ran into problems with that trying to use it for upgrading. So I'm, I've been resorting just to, you know, when I upgrade, I just dump all the text and then load it back in. But that's, that still works too. So um, Yeah, I, I do so, that quite a bit actually yeah, if I can. If the database is small and, enough, then I'll often do a dump and restore uh, just because it's simple and, and I know it works. Yes. Uh, how about RDS? Does it work with uh, Amazon's product? Uh, Amazon has their own backup solutions. I'm, I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. Uh, I actually talk to Grant McAllister pretty regularly. He shows up at, at most of the post conferences and, or Postgres conferences. So they have a, a solution based on snapshotting and wall archiving uh, built into RDS. Uh, it's unfortunately not possible to get binary copies of your database out of RDS, which I do consider to be a bit of a weakness. Oh, so because uh, one of my clients has now moved their database to RDS, and I guess this is completely out of the picture for that then. That's too bad. Um, yeah, oh well, but it, it, really, <laughs> they, it, it really is. Um, part of the reason is that up until recently, you had to be a super user to even run the start and stop backup commands. So mm -hmm. Stephen Frost has uh, fixed that problem in 9.6. Uh, I was trying to get a patch committed in 9.7 that would allow, uh, you know, group level permissions on the, uh, uh, you know, cluster directory so that you could do backups mm. as a, as a non-privileged uh, user. And uh, unfortunately, we weren't quite able to get that in. It touched a lot of areas of the code. And so I decided to voluntarily pull, uh, voluntarily pull it and, and try again for that feature in 10.0. But after we get some of those features in, that might make it easier for Amazon to open up a binary copy of the data and allow people to get at it directly. Cool. Well, I know uh, Guillermo has a couple more questions to ask. He's uh, chomping at the bit here, but I have an important message to bring all of you. So this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Cloudflare. Cloudflare is on a mission to help build a better internet. Cloudflare makes your site faster, safer, and more reliable so you can stop worrying about slow loading page times, downtime, or getting hacked. Cloudflare is incredibly easy to use and sign up takes less than five minutes. Cloudflare's global network of more than 100 data centers caches your content and moves it closer to visitors. They'll automatically enable all the latest internet protocols like IPv6 and HTTPS rewrites that keep you fast and secure. Your domain will automatically configure to utilize HTTP2. End-to-end -end Cloudflare speeds up every request to your site with performant DNS, caching, content optimization, load balancing, and more. Make your site or app or API more secure because Cloudflare doesn't only provide DDoS protection. Their web application firewall is powered by a massive IP reputation that updates for all users. And using Cloudflare gives your business the option to use more than one cloud provider so you don't get locked into any of them. Plus, Cloudflare caches so much of your content you'll end up saving big on your cloud compute bill. Plans range from free, $20 a month, $200 a month, and custom plans for enterprise. Cloudflare's free plan is part of their mission to help build a better internet. One where builders, makers, writers, everyone who has a good idea can reach a global audience. No matter what plan you sign up for with Cloudflare, you're joining a massive neighborhood watch for the edge of the internet. Cloudflare is offering the Twit listeners a free online chat session with one of their top support engineers to answer any of your questions. Visit cloudflare.com slash twit to sign up today. That's cloudflare.com slash twit. And we thank Cloudflare for their support of Floss Weekly. And now, Guillermo, you had a question? Uh, so, okay. yeah, the uh, question was, uh, I know that uh, you mentioned that uh, PG Backrest has uh, uh, JSON support, right? Uh, but I guess it's 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 probably good a good question to ask if it does have a lumbar support. Uh, no, uh, the idea was <laughs> actually just to uh, rather than having uh, trying to support a, a lot of different formats and standards, to just support one really common one, and and then people can sort of connect that up uh, and do whatever translation they need to do uh, on their own. Otherwise, it's kind of a a never-ending chase to kind of chase down all the different formats and standards that people would like to use or, or that their uh, monitoring solutions use. Okay, well, uh, you know, I do have another question here. Uh, I am, uh, I was wondering if you have this running on your server, how, how much overhead would this be? Uh, does it actually require a lot of processing and everything? I, I know you mentioned 
uh, that this is able to, you know, keep a lot of copies and contact other servers? Is there going to be a lot of overhead if you run this? It really depends. Uh, there can be quite a bit of overhead. It depends on how large your database is and uh, how much parallelism you opt for. So, for instance, if you're running with, you know, one process, which is the default um, for smaller installations, then you're probably not going to have a lot of overhead because you'll max out on one core on compression. And, you know, that's not going to chew up a lot of I.O. and it won't chew up a lot of network bandwidth. However, as you scale, so let's say you've decided to use, uh, like I said, like we've seen once or twice in the field, uh, 64 cores uh, for compression. Well, it you know, Backrest will use all of that, uh, basically all the processing power on each of those cores that you dedicate to it, uh, as long as there's enough I.O. bandwidth to keep the cores fed. So these days you're seeing more and more SSD-based solutions, which will happily, uh, you know, send that data up to the cores. So, yeah, you can you can really use a lot of resources. However, what I always tell people is back up slowly. You know, you don't need to be in this great rush to get a backup. If you can do your weekly full backup in a day or so, and or if you have, you know, a, a low time when you can do backups and schedule it for that, and then you're getting a couple of incrementals or differentials during the week to make your restore times less, then you should really be pretty happy with that. You don't need to worry about backing up extremely quickly. However, where, where it comes in really handy is restore. So restore is an area where you do want to that you want it to happen really quickly because your database is down and you want to get it back up as quickly as possible. Uh, since the database is down, you don't really have to worry about using a lot of resources. In fact, you should be using all of the system's resources in order to get that restore completed. So the Delta Restore feature that we have, uh, what it does, it actually does checksums, uh, SHA-1 checksums on all the files that exist on the disk, and then we'll only pull the files from the backup that it needs. So depending on the rate of change in your database, restores can be incredibly fast, and they're safe because everything is checksummed. Uh, and even for a full restore, uh, it's still incredibly fast because you've got multiple decompression streams going, et cetera. So how many resources you decide to use is really up to you. It scales from minimal to essentially as much as you want. Okay, so if you have this on like a uh, very, let's say, popular API uh, backend or something, and it's always getting used, uh, would this slow down slow down the uh, service? I'm guessing you're locking tables and everything just to uh, be able to do a, like a static, you know, one, a snapshot of everything, right? Uh, would oh, this slow everything down? Absolutely not. Uh, the good thing is, unlike PG dump, which actually does uh, put certain types of locks on structures, although normally you won't notice that unless you're creating uh, structures dynamically or whatever, uh, Backrest takes absolutely no locks on the database at all. So the way it works is the way all uh, Postgres binary backup works. It essentially notifies the database that it wants to start taking a backup. And the database puts a marker, or actually, sorry, at that point it just uh, creates a checkpoint, You know, does a checkpoint so all the data is written to disk, it switches the wall segments, and then it gives you a starting location where your backup is starting. And then you, at that point, all you're doing is copying files, however you want to. You can use rsync, tar. Uh, in Backrest case, it uses its own you know, code that I've written to make that work. And when you're done, you tell Postgres you're done, and it writes a marker into the wall saying this is the end of the backup. And it has the start backup location there as well. So you know when you do a restore, all Postgres knows is that it essentially looks like it crashed. Uh, so what it's going to do is go into the backup label that was written, find the initial checkpoint where the backup started, and then replay all the write-ahead log from that location to the end of backup location and then beyond if you specify that. So really, when you're looking at the load on the server, you're not looking at any direct load on the database in terms of locking or, or uh, page cache or anything like that. All you're looking at is I.O., to get the files off of the disk and CPU to do the compression and of course network to you know move that data off of the server. Okay, uh, well, other options. That, that, uh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say well, one more option you have is you can actually do your backup from a standby instead. So uh, it will go and actually copy the vast majority of the files from the standby and only copy a few files from the master. So if you really want to keep the load off your master, that would be the way you do it. 
Okay, so uh, you know, you you mentioned uh, that uh, before. You mentioned that you have like an SSH uh, tunnel, you know, in order to communicate between the, uh, I guess, where your uh, backup is going to get stored and where you're copying it from, right? Uh, can, can you maybe go into a little bit of the uh, communication model you're using? Is it going to be uh, something you know, point to point only? Can you have many listeners it, that they all get a uh, you know a copy of the backup, or how how, how does it actually work? Okay, well, currently it is point to point. So uh, Backrest is installed symmetrically. So you install the same version, you know, of Backrest all over the place. There's no client or server. Uh, there's just you know the Backrest binary. You install that. So when Backrest needs a service from someplace else, uh, it makes a connection to uh, that server. So it might be a, making a connection to the master to start the backup, uh, the backup server to copy files, things like that. Uh, you know, of archiving. So all the connections are point to point, but any particular backrest uh, process might hold be holding multiple of them uh, at any given time. Uh, the protocol itself is very simple. It's actually all JSON based, which shouldn't be too surprising since we're using JSON in other areas. We figured, you know, just reuse it. Uh, you know, the only complicated part is the binary transfer uh, area where the you know checksumming, compression, and transfer and all that kind of stuff is done. Uh, but other than that, it's extremely simple. We are looking at, uh, you know, like for instance, one of the problems we have right now, uh, not a problem exactly, but one of the limitations of Backrest is uh, if you're using backup server, you end up with one backup server, which obviously means a single point of failure. Now, that doesn't mean that Backrest can't be used in an HA solution. In an HA solution, your idea is to be eliminating single points of failure by creating other redundancies. So in an HA solution, your replicas uh, might be your one of your redundancies. Uh, another thing that most uh, enterprises do is they'll actually back up the backrest repository using their enterprise backup software. So they have another offsite backup somewhere of the uh, backrest repository. So there are a lot of ways to make it HA, but one of the features we would like to add in the near future is the ability to have multiple backup servers and have them talk to each other and sync up you know, sync up data so whoever gets the data gets the data, and then the backup servers make sure that there are multiple available copies of it. Yeah, so I was asking if uh, maybe you can go into the uh, into what else are you planning for a PG backrest? You mentioned this feature, uh, you know, having multiple, I guess, receivers for the backup. Uh, but is something else in your uh, roadmap? Maybe something you know closer down the road that you can, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're you're already working on. Sure. Uh, the well, let me talk about some of the things we've just added very recently because I don't know how uh, recently you've really been looking at the website. But the two big features we added recently were parallel uh, archiving. So this means if you've got a really big busy system and you're creating a lot of write-ahead log, uh, Backrest can actually uh, compress and transfer those files in parallel. Previously, parallelism was reserved for backup and restore. Uh, the other feature we added recently, which uh, has now that more of the packagers are getting the C library in is useful is Backrest will check all of your page checksums during the backup. So since Postgres 9.3, you've been able to initialize your database with page checksums. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do with them until you find out that you've got an invalid block. And then Postgres will just tell you and you know stop your query. Uh, there's mitigation you can do there. You can zero out the block and there's other things you can do. If it's an index, you could rebuild it. But rather than find that out one or two years down the road, uh, Backrest will tell you with every backup whether all your page checksums are, are good or not. Um, this isn't a, a complete uh, fix for corruption. It's better for, you know, say, block-level corruption, disk-level corruption, stuff like that. But it's certainly something, and it's a lot better than finding out years down the road. The very next feature that we're working on, which we're expecting to have out in May, is S3 support. Uh, this has been a big ask for some time. Uh, some of the backup software that's out there does S3 support, notably Wally. So we're trying to uh, eliminate that complaint, if you will, by getting that S3 backend in so that, and obviously it's one of the easiest ways to backup offsite. Uh, so now you'll be able to store your backups directly in S3. We looked at trying to use a fuse driver or something like S3FS, uh, but unfortunately the performance was not very good because it's trying to make the uh, mount look POSIX compliant, which S3 very definitely is not. So we've decided we'd be better off actually just working with S3 directly. And so that's actually the code I am have started on this week. 
And we expected to have that uh, tested and, and ready and out the door uh, sometime in May. Uh, after that, the next big feature we're looking at is parallel archive get. Uh, so that means a, a ability to uh, fetch in parallel uh, multiple archive files and store those locally so that when Postgres needs them, you know, they're ready to go. What's your community like? Are, 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 are you the sole committer? Do you have a bunch of people helping you out? I mean, who's, who's participating in this? So the community is slowly growing. Uh, I'm I'm the sole committer at this time. Uh, the other major contributor is Cynthia Shang, who also works for Crunchy Data. So uh, she works on a lot of features uh, as well, especially around you know backup management and stuff like that. Uh, primarily, at this to this point, you know we've had some contributions made from you know just exa exact code contributions made by people in the community. We also get a lot of testing. So we have a lot of diehard fans out there who are happy to take the most recent version, uh, deploy it in their enterprises, and sometimes they're quite large, and you know get get us feedback on new features and uh, let us know if something's been broken or something's not working. We're really big on testing, so we test extensively. We use Travis for our uh, continuous integration on GitHub, but the mm -hmm. problem is with new features is that. Even if you're testing, you know your test coverage is extremely good. Or and for our new features, it's generally 100%. Uh, you know, statement and conditional and and uh, coverage. It, it can be things can be left out. So sometimes you just forget something that in retrospect was really obvious, and all the testing in the world isn't going to tell you that. So especially for the new features, we have people who need them enough that they're willing to deploy them, and give us feedback and let us know if there's anything wrong. Then we can write new tests. Uh, for the fixes, and so if we have a regression mm -hmm. in the future. So from a regression standpoint, Backrest is extremely well covered. If if we break something in an in a existing area while we're doing new code, then the test suite is very good at telling us that. Um, but like I said, new features can always have bugs in them that just weren't, you know, things you didn't think of. And if you didn't even think to code them, you certainly didn't think to test them. Uh, but so the, the testing, you know, uh, from the community, uh, if you go to the GitHub page and look through the issues, the historical issues, you can see there have been over time a lot of contributors who have found bugs. Uh, you know, I always make sure all those contributors gets, get credit in the release notes. Uh, so that's another good place to look if you want to kind of see the variety of people who have contributed over time. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, as I said, it's primarily, uh, you know, testing and debugging is where we've gotten beginning most of our contributions to date. There have been maybe a, a dozen contributors of actual patches. Cool, cool. And um, what has there been a need for any um, upstream changes to Postgres itself to support the things you were you're trying to roll out? Um. Well, yes. <laughs> well, a, a need <laughs> is strong. Well, the thing yes. is, is that because we support so many versions of Postgres, it's not really possible to look at a change in Postgres as something that's required for backrest, right? So uh, especially, yeah. say, for the parallel archiving, we had to be a bit clever about that and figure out a way that would work all the way back to version 8.3. Now, we're not necessarily against having some features that are only supported, uh, you know, some kind of version forward, especially if it's an advanced feature, which is less likely to be uh, useful for people on very old versions of Postgres. But in general, we like to have the features work across as many versions as possible. So the approach we've been taking is to make things better uh, with contributions to Postgres. Uh, let me give an example for the new version of Postgres. One of the things I've noticed as I've been working through the Postgres source code in relation to backup is there are a lot of parts of the database that actually are not persistent. Uh, so if you go into the Postgres directory, and uh, there are a bunch of directories in there, right? You know, the, the PG data directory. But really, only mm -hmm. a couple of those are persistent. Really just uh, multi-exact, C-log, uh, base, and global, and any table spaces that you might have. So all those other files, especially all the temp files that Postgres stores, you know, while you're creating a temp table or doing a really big sort, are actually deleted when the system is, or the database is restarted, or when it's recovered from a backup. So I figured out all the files that did not need to be backed up and submitted those as a patch to Postgres, uh, which got review from all the people who had written those various subsections, and they all chimed in and said, yeah, we actually don't need to back any of that up. It gets reinitialized on startup. And so there's an example. Um, 
another patch I contributed to uh, version 10, which of course will be the next version, is one to uh, right now currently when you do a stop backup, Postgres waits for all the write ahead log to be archived. Uh, but Backrest also does that monitoring, so I added a feature to allow the stop backup command to return immediately, rather than you know being stuck blocking in that command. And then Backrest actually does its own monitoring. And it just makes the system run a little more smoothly because you don't have to try to cancel that query or wonder did it really stop the backup. Uh, you know the back the actual stop backup happens at the very beginning, but it's a race condition. You know what if there's some delay, so you don't really know when mm. you can cancel the stop backup and still have a good and valid backup. So with this contribution, it's no longer an issue. Uh, we've also, like I said, my colleague Stephen Frost uh, contributed uh, being able to run start and stop backup as a non-super user. Uh, we're also working on the patch to be able to do the file level backup as a non-super user, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these are focused towards making you know the newer versions of Backrest run more smoothly. And not just for Backrest, of course. I mean, anything that we put into Postgres is... Uh, so, for instance, the exclusions that are done now in post you know, that, that that I added are all done in base backup as well. So, base backup will not back up any of those you know extraneous files that don't need to be backed up anymore. So, yes, yeah, so we we definitely actively think about contributing to Postgres and how to make things smoother and faster. And uh, one of the things we're thinking about is having base backup do page level checksums like Backrest does. Uh, there's really no reason why it couldn't. And so that seems like an obvious next contribution, although the uh, feature freeze for V10 just happened, so that would be a, a version 11 feature. Okay, cool. And what license is this under? It's MIT. Uh, ah, mostly not... Very liberal. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Not, uh, I, I like the very liberal license. MIT is the default for uh, uh, for GitHub. I really do want you know, everyone to be able to use it. That does include, in theory, obviously, integrate it into a closed source project. Uh, but I, I feel if it's going to be free, it should be completely free. Yes, and I like the fact that these free licenses, uh, although we've had this debate many times on this show, these free licenses, the more freer license like BSD and MIT license, things like that, actually give the original author and the first user exactly the same rights. Whereas yes. the L, the GPL, the first author has a special privileged position, and everybody right. else is equally lower. And you know, one of the things that we talk about constantly in the Postgres community is how difficult it can be to integrate things uh, with other, you know, less permissive licenses into Postgres at all. And so there are some things we'd like to bring in, and we're just not able to do it because of licensing conflicts. So I understand that with the MIT license, it could be possible that some big corporation will take Backrest, close source a version of it, and package it and, and sell it. Uh, it also means that other projects, we were talking earlier about a, a possible MySQL port. And if someone wanted to do that, they could just do that. And uh, you yeah. know, there would be no restrictions on the license. And, and if they had existing uh, code with another license, they wouldn't have to worry from the Backrest standpoint, at, at least how they integrated that. And I presume this is already uh, packaged up for all the various uh, Linux distros and probably FreeBSD and all the other guys out there? Uh, the only ones I'm sure of are Debian. And uh, so it's it's packaged for all the Debian-based systems. So that would be Ubuntu mm -hmm. 12 and up, uh, Debian, I, I think, 7 and up. And it definitely for CentOS and RHEL as well. All those packages can be, uh, for instance, the first... Uh, distribution, I think, will be with Debian SID. Uh, that's the first Debian that will include PG Backrest in its, you know, in its default package set. Uh, well, you know, at least the ones you can download, not the things that would be installed by default when you install. But you can also get all of this from app.postgres.org. Uh, so you can get the Debian and Ubuntu packages there, and you can also get the CentOS and RHEL packages. And other than Perl, obviously, is there any other big dependencies that, that would uh, throw you off here? Uh, really not SSH, obviously. Uh, you do need to have a certain version of SSH, although the oldest operating system that we support and test on is CentOS 6, which has a pretty old version of SSH, and that actually works just fine, other than the fact that some of the error messages are a little different than newer versions. But uh, other than that, so you can run on, on pretty old stuff. Uh, the Perl requirements are, you know, it's 5.10, 
So it's actually a pretty old version of Perl that is supported. And all of the uh, additional modules that are needed, uh, there aren't many, uh, but they're actually available as packages on all the operating systems that we test on. So you don't have cool. to say they, install CPAN or do anything like that. Cool, cool. Yeah, uh, Guillermo just whispered in my ear here, uh, open SSH or drop bearer? I presume it's a different kind of SSH. Uh, I, our testing has all been on open SSH, but I can't see any reason why uh, any other, there, there really isn't a lot, uh, you know, really special options being used. So if it's reasonably command line compatible, then you know it should be fine. The only thing we do is for certain communications channels, we turn off compression. Uh, Backrest actually does its own compression, so having SSH do it again doesn't make any sense. So the main comm channel is compressed, but all the file transfer channels are uh, uncompressed from the perspective of SSH. But other than that, not a lot of special features used. Okay, cool, cool. And we're almost out of time. Uh, is there anything we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of? Oh, boy. Uh, boy, I should have an answer to that. <laughs> it's the most difficult I, question we ask our guests every time, though. So I just want, it's, I, I'll, because it's like now you have to go through and take everything you wanted to talk about and subtract out the things in real time that we actually did talk about. And then right, come up with right. a different set and talk about it. Yeah, it's a difficult question. I understand. <laughs> I, I feel like the set of questions was pretty comprehensive. I mean, the main thing I would say is, uh, you know, I'm really excited to get more people out there using it. I think it's a really uh, easy piece of software. It's a very performant piece of software, especially for people who have large systems. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to see more people using it. I'd like to see, uh, you know, I, I'd like the, to say that, you know, obviously people should be feel uh, feel free to do contributions. This is a, mm -hmm. even though Crunchy supports uh, the development quite a bit, it is a completely free and open piece of software uh, and a completely independent project. So uh, people should be, you know, uh, feel free to contribute. Um, I'm interested in all contributions. Obviously, I may not be able to accept all patches as, as they are, uh, but ideas, patches, testing, all of those things, um, I'd really like to go to the community uh, even more than it has been grown. And I'm, I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that growing over time. Cool, cool, cool. And uh, so I have to ask my two required questions, especially since you're a hacker. I have to definitely ask <laughs> these of you. Um, okay. What's your uh, favorite scripting language and what is your text editor you spend all day in? Uh, okay, well, I guess my favorite scripting language is Perl. <laughs> uh, yay! It's, it's yay, one from my side. Yay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's certainly the one I spend most of my time in. I, I think Perl actually gets a really bad rap a lot of the time. Uh, you yes. know, it, it's kind of derided as a write-only language, and you can certainly write it as a write-only language. Uh, I have had a lot of people look at the PG Backrest project and and uh, write back to me in all caps how impressed they are by how readable it is and how, you know, I use all the modern structures and strict in English and everything. And mm -hmm. they say, it just doesn't seem like Perl at all. So you yes. can write Perl <laughs> in a very readable and modular way. A lot of people just don't bother to. And as for my text editor, I've been using uh, Atom for about a year oh. and a half now. So uh, yeah. it's it's free. I was using, I believe, before that TextMate, uh, mostly okay. just too cheap to pay for Sublime Text, <laughs> which is a really great editor. <laughs> uh, but I feel like yeah. Atom has uh, incorporated a lot of the good features of Sublime Text, and it's completely free, and it's also multi-platform. So developers that I work with who are working on Windows or Linux – uh, we can all use the same editor and, and, you know, I can give them scripts to deal with the quirks and things like that. So definitely yeah, we're working on getting the, uh, yeah, we're working on getting the Adam people on this show because it it's, has definitely come up a lot and um, conferences I go to and, and demonstrations stuff. So yeah, very good. Uh, hey, David, it's been great having you on the show. I, I, I now know you'll have a lot more uh, potential new downloads of this software and more uh, people <laughs> participating in your community because that's what my community does as they go out and try out new things. So thanks for being on the show. All right, Randy, thank you very much for having me. Awesome, awesome. That was David Steele talking to us about PG Backrest. What do you think there, Guillermo? Okay, so, yes. uh, yeah, I, it, it does seem to be something that I would use if I would still be in the, you know, uh, hosting business, uh, which I used to be back in the early 2000s. Uh, yeah. It does seem like something that I will uh, tell my my current employer and 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 uh, you know clients about because it does it would help a lot and I know a, a, a bunch of them do use uh, Postgres so 
you know, it, it is something that I like. The only issue I have is the no lumbar support for a backrest. Uh, <laughs> you need to do something about that. <laughs> That, that joke was just uh, a little too uh, deep for today, I think. Maybe that was the yeah, problem. I know, yes, I know. I know. Uh, you know me. You know me. <laughs> well, English isn't your native language. You wouldn't have known that we would understand that at all. So <laughs> anyway, well, sorry, know. sorry. Anyway, yeah. And I like this. I, I, I like that we have, uh, you know, people bolting on things onto Postgres. Uh, the Postgres community is huge. And Postgres is used by some of the world's largest databases. I, as I recall, the, um, the database that runs uh, .org and .net is a live Postgres database with, you know, billions of records. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a huge installation there. So um, big stuff for that. And, and I'm always a big fan of Postgres. I mean, every time I see somebody, you know, select the wrong database like MySQL or, uh, or anything that's related to that, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm annoyed because Postgres has so many cool things to, to offer for that. So, uh, yeah, any, any, any last words before I start uh, talking about who's coming up? Uh, no, not really. Go ahead. Okay, so let's... So let's do it. Here's the rundown of what's coming up. Uh, next week, we are moving to a very special time, a very special Floss Weekly. We're actually moving to Wednesday instead of Tuesday. Same time of day, so 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, uh, except it'll be Wednesday, not Tuesday. But we're going to bring on Screen Studio, which is a way to record and stream your full-res desktop and webcam. And it looks really cool. It's actually cross-platform. It runs on, um, runs on uh, Mac OS and uh, Linux and Windows all across the board. So that's pretty cool. Following that, uh, back on Tuesdays again, Stacky, which is a bare metal provisioning tool uh, from the creators of Rocks. Uh, following that, we've got FreeNAS Corral. So Jason Hubbard, the benevolent dictator for life for FreeNAS, is coming on to talk about uh, what's new in FreeNAS, which includes this uh, better clustering and things like that. Immediately following that is OSCON. I will be at OSCON in Austin and uh, looking for a guest all day Monday until I can have a guest for Tuesday morning. Otherwise, it's just going to be me and some people chatting online. I don't know what we're going to do if I can't find a guest in one day, but we'll make it happen. We'll, we, we've done this every year, so I'm pretty good at getting it down there. Uh, Kubernetes is going to be updated. Uh, we last talked to them in August 2015, but a lot of things have happened, particularly uh, that's sort of an orchest orchestration tool for, for Docker images. Uh, NPM, the Node.js package manager, is uh, going to then join us the week following that. We're still filling more slots, as I am constantly. Uh, uh, you go to twit.tv slash floss, which is the homepage for this show. You can see the ones that I'm working on. And if you have somebody that should be on this show uh, that uh, is not on that list, please have the project leader or community coordinator or something like that. Uh, email me, merlin at stonehenge.com. Uh, we have a live stream. We took a couple questions from it today. That's at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, usually Tuesdays. Next week, it'll be Wednesday. And that's uh, accessible at live to twit.tv. You can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. You can uh, go to at Floss Weekly on Twitter and follow that instead if you don't like Google+, Plus or you don't know how to figure it out. You follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Plus. It's where I source uh, most of my bloggish sort of information when I'm not just chatting with my friends on Facebook. And that also uh, uh, tweets over to Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N. So uh, I am going to be at a whole bunch of conferences. So this is conference season coming up. Uh, I'm going to be at the Red Hat Summit in Boston. And then immediately following that, the week will be... Uh, Oscon in Austin. So there's a complex trip coming up in the next uh, month or so. Uh, I'll be at Yapsi actually giving a talk on Pearl best practices, except I have a talk called Pearl second best practices because I disagree with Damien on some of the things there. Um, I just got added as press to allthingsopen.org. That's a conference that happens in October in the research triangle. So I'll actually, I think it'll be the first time I've ever been there. So uh, it'll be fun, but they, they're giving me um, carte blanche to come in and uh, look for cool projects to put on this show. In fact, in all these conferences I'm talking about, I'm going to be looking for more guests. Uh, so hopefully there'll be a lot more on the list. And then finally, my uh, One Indulgence conference every year, Dragon Con, uh, coming up in Hotlanta in September. Uh, if you see me at any of these conferences, please, please come up, say hi. Um, I love meeting uh, y'all uh, and, uh, and I love hearing the impact that uh, this show has had, uh, especially over the years, if you've been a longtime listener. Um, so uh, that's all I have to plug today. Uh, Guillermo, what do you want to plug? Uh, well, let's see. I'll be in uh, Comic-Con this year, like almost every year. And I'll also be in uh, BitCon uh, later this year. Uh, aside from that, I don't think I'm going to do any other conference, but I'll check. Uh, yeah, and like, I guess people can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I am at G-A-M-A-R-E-L or at Gamaral. Uh, and you can look for me on YouTube. I also have a YouTube channel where I do, you know, technology, STEM things, and you can check those out if you're interested. 
I, cool. I think that's cool, cool, it. cool. All right. Well, Guillermo, thank you for uh, um, assisting me today and uh, and uh, jumping in there and being the co-host for today's show. No problem, Matt. Anytime. Cool, cool, cool. And uh, so, uh, without further ado, we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. And by the way, totally embarrassed about the lumbar support thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a deep joke. It was it was it was a side uh, joke. Don't know. worry about it. I, I, I should have made a, a funnier about, face when I asked that. <laughs> I'm always getting yeah. tons of questions about obscure uh, monitoring software and and just just wacky stuff. Right. Uh, I speak at a lot of conferences and I always get like a string of questions about X, Y, and Z. So I've gotten yep. to the point where I just sort of deflect them by saying what we did rather than what we don't do. And um, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> so so no, you got the, me. The that issue right now is that uh, JavaScript has so many frameworks and stuff like that out there that you can. Pr you, I I would not be surprised if there is a lumbar. Yeah, you know, I looked somewhere. it up just to see if I could uh, you know cover myself on this one. I couldn't find anything relevant. So no, but yeah. So Guillermo, uh, you're gonna have to start one. I I know. I I thought about it too. I thought maybe I could make this like a, a weekly thing. I could start a low bar project later on or something. Well, maybe lumbar. Okay, would is, be, I gotta... uh, maybe lumbar I, yeah. would be the MySQL port of PG backrest. Oh, good Ooh, idea. boy. Uh, <laughs> My yes. My lumbar. My lumbar. <laughs> <laughs>